In 331 BC, Alexander the Great established a city named after him in Egypt. This city was called Alexandria. This city very quickly became a cosmopolitan city full of people from all over the globe. You see, Alexander established this city in the sense that everyone would be equal. Even though Alexander himself was Greek and his general Ptolemy, who would end up ruling Egypt, was also Greek, he wanted Greek citizens and non-Greek citizens alike to be equal in all ways. Alexandria very quickly became the central focal point of learning. And in fact, it was Alexander the Great himself that wanted Alexandria's wealth to be one of knowledge. And Alexandria flourished. Under the Ptolemy reign, they established the library of Alexandria, a library unlike any library we've ever had before. But unfortunately, as the tides started to turn in our greater world, as Constantine the Great declared Christianity to be the official religion of the Roman Empire, death and destruction happened all across Alexandria. The loss of the Great Library, along with a lot of its scholars, pushed us into the Dark Ages, a time in our human history that would last about 500 years. And sadly, a lot of the works that were in that great library are gone forever. But it was one murder in particular that upsets us the most. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button and give us a like. Once again, I also want to give a shout out to our producer and my dear friend, Tiffany Monroe. Again, she is a Reiki master and teacher here in our fair city of Atlanta, Georgia. If you would like to get in touch with Tiffany to discuss potentially using her services or getting involved in an alternative version of healing, her email address is listed down below. All right, let's get started. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce and today we are going to be talking about Hypatia. was born in the middle of the 4th century, anywhere between 350 AD and 375 AD. She was the daughter of a nobleman. Her father was a man by the name of Theon of Alexandria, and Theon himself was a great scholar, especially in mathematics. Theon was one of the last attested members of the museum. The museum was a part of the Library of Alexandria. You see, many people believe that the Library of Alexandria that was built in the Ptolemaic reign in the BC times was destroyed in 48 BC by Julius Caesar. This is not necessarily true. Yes, we know from our prior videos that Julius Caesar did wage a war against Ptolemy the 13th around this time with the help of Cleopatra, video linked below if you missed it, and there was fire that was set in the harbor. However, only a small part of the Alexandrian library was affected by this fire, and most of the scrolls were saved before the fire damaged a lot of stuff. So for the next 300 years, this library kept going. Now there was a slight decline, especially when the Roman Empire took over Egypt after Mark Antony and Cleopatra's downfall. However, the city of Alexandria continued to be this mecca, if you will, of everything scholarly. In fact, the Library of Alexandria ran more like a university where they had not only scrolls and then eventually codex, which was our first version of a book, but we also had lecture halls where professors, including Hypatia, would work with her students. And in fact, at one point, this uh, focus of knowledge was so important to Egypt that the Pharaoh would pay scholars 
to study, basically. He would pay them to spend their time in this library learning and experimenting and pushing humanity forward, their accommodation paid for, their meals paid for, everything taken care of just so they could learn. Well, of course, Hypatia, being the daughter of Theon, got a first-rate education from her father. Her and her father were very close. And through many accounts from what I've read and researched, it wasn't long until Hypatia became a contemporary of her father, where she spent more time debating him than learning from him. In fact, it seems that Hypatia was probably one of the smartest women around at that time. And by some of the letters written by her students, we know that she probably was the first female mathematician. Now at this point, math, science, and philosophy were all one and the same. Now, if you follow us on David's channel, I believe I've spoken about this before. For our ancient forefathers, math and science came one-on-one -on -one with philosophy and spirituality. They were not different. And it is my opinion that the Federal Reserve governmental system is the one that tries to separate the two so that as human beings, we see things as separate and not the same. Now, a couple of decades before Hypatia's birth, Constantine the Great had made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. Now, from our video on Wednesday, which again, I will link below if you haven't seen, Constantine's version of Christianity was not really Christianity. It wasn't really based on the teachings of Jesus. It was based on another religion called Mithraism. Definitely a more brutal and a more violent faith than the original teachings of Jesus. Well, you see, most of the Roman Empire at this time was a form of a pagan faith. They had multiple gods. And in a city like Alexandria, you had many different groups of religions in the same town. Now, those of us who live in the Western world, either America or Canada or, or Europe, this is normal. I mean, it's not as big of a deal nowadays as it was back then to have all these different groups of religious sects and people. But back then, this was a huge deal. And by the time Hypatia was born, the city of Alexandria was in a bit of turmoil. In fact, it was noted in one of my sources that this was a very hard city for the Roman Empire to control. Now, if you're looking at something like Hypatia and this university of knowledge, this, this library of Alexandria, of course, in order for a scientist or a philosopher, a mathematician to be able to understand the gravity of everything they're trying to learn and study, they have to be able to look at everything. And Hypatia, even though she was a pagan, she also practiced a form of philosophy called Neoplatism. Now, Neoplatism was based off of Plato's being in itself or one truth. It was intellectual, it was mystical, and it had optional rituals basically to fit the individual's need. The three elements of Neoplatism was unity, intelligence, and soul. Now, looking at the concept of Neoplatism, and there's a lot of information out there if you wanna go deeper into what this philosophy actually says, in my opinion, and in Hypatia's opinion, this philosophy did not conflict with the teachings of Jesus. In fact, this philosophy basically said, Whatever your perception is of God is your perception of God. Therefore, whatever rituals you need to do to get closer to God is something you can do. But it's not uniformed to the entirety of mankind. I do believe that most Christians today would understand this and agree with this philosophy and see that its roots do not conflict with Jesus's teaching. In fact, they're more alike than they are separate. Well, this wasn't true with Constantine's concept of the church. And again, I believe that Constantine was never a Christian. I believe that him using the Christian name was purely propaganda for him to push his Canaanite and satanic practices onto the Roman Empire. 
But nonetheless, his early church doctrine was based on principles of doctrinal unity. This means that everybody must believe the same thing and practice that faith in the exact same way. Again, taking on more of a Mithra-based faith, not at all a faith of Jesus. Well, because of this aggression, the Roman troops and different sects of this um, Christian faith were quite violent within the city of Alexandria. We also had different sects of Judaism coming into the city and, of course, paganism, which was technically what Hypatia believed was more of a pagan-based faith, although it seems like she was grandfathered into a pagan faith because everything I researched about her, she was just a scholar at the end of the day. And sadly, for Hypatia and for our whole world, by Hypatia's behavior, by her attitude, she seemed to carry more of the teachings of Christ than any of the bishops in the city, and especially the leaders of the Roman Empire. Theopolis was the Bishop of Alexandria from 382 to 412 AD. Now, even though Theopolis hated the pagans and was very much against Neoplatism, he did leave Hypatia alone. He seemed to have a lot of respect for her and all the work that she had done. In fact, she was respected around town, just like the male scholars wore. She wore the scholarly robes that many of the male teachers wore. And she drove her own chariot, which was super taboo for a woman back in those days. It is believed that she never married because she didn't want to become a wife and give up her studies. Her studies were her life. She was involved in a lot of councils and committees in the city, respected by so many leaders that would come to her seeking her advice on governmental problems. So even though the beliefs of the bishop were her very much in contrast to Hypatia's beliefs, everything was fine. Even though there was turbulence and riots and all sorts of outbreaks between these religious sects, Hypatia, again, was left in peace to continue her work. All up until Theopolis' unexpected death, again, in 412 AD. Cyril was Theopolis's nephew, and it was always assumed that he would take over Theopolis's role as the Bishop of Alexandria, although that was never confirmed. So when he, Theopolis died unexpectedly, Cyril tried to step up and take on the role. However, he was challenged by a man named Timothy. There was some battles between the two men and their supporters, and eventually Cyril won. And when he won, he decided to take out revenge on every person who had supported Timothy. It became quite clear to the city of Alexandria that Cyril was a very violent bishop. Cyril began these massive attacks against sects and groups of people who were not Christian. One of the first groups that he attacked were the, the Jewish people. And in 414, the Jewish people attacked back. Well, the massacre did not last that long. Cyril and his gang of people squashed it pretty quickly. And so to take revenge, Cyril closed all of the Jewish synagogues in the city, confiscated all the property owned by Jewish citizens, and exiled a lot of them out of Egypt. Orestes was the governor of Alexandria. He was also a friend of Hypatia, and allegedly he was also converted to this new Christian faith. When Cyril did what he did to the Jewish people, closing the synagogues, taking their property, kicking them out, Orestes got very upset, and he wrote a scathing letter to the Roman emperor to tell him what this wild child bishop had done to people in this city. When word got out about the letter Orestes had written, there was a massive outbreak. The people that supported Cyril pulled Orestes out into the public and almost killed him. 
the result of that outbreak was the monk who started the outbreak got dragged out into the street himself and was tortured to death publicly. Because of Orestes' relationship with Hypatia and because of Hypatia's status in the town, these events would cause her eventual downfall. Now, it is my opinion that Cyril's hatred for Hypatia had absolutely nothing to do with her religion. I highly doubt that somebody who has truly accepted the love and the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ would be as violent as someone like Cyril was. In fact, I believe Cyril, like Constantine, used this faith to control, to dominate, and to hurt other people. So in Cyril's own form of psychopathic narcissism, he viewed Hypatia as a threat because Hypatia, again, was loved by the town. She had students of all faiths. She had Christians and pagans and Jewish people. Everybody loved Hypatia. Hypatia was against violence. She saw value in everybody's mind and everybody's way of life. Well, this popularity of Hypatia was definitely dangerous for Cyril. It was also dangerous for him because she had so many students who loved and adored her that were international. She could potentially cause a coup against him. Not to mention, I'm sure deep down, Cyril is also jealous of her too. Jealous of her popularity amongst everyone. At this point, Cyril developed the ultimate smear campaign. He started to tell people that Hypatia was a witch. And that all these studies that she was doing, this astronomy-based study, this math, everything was none other than just casting spells. He tried to have the people of Alexandria fear her, and it worked. No, not for everyone. Again, she was so beloved that not everyone fell for the smear campaign, but there was a group of people that one day pulled Hypatia out of her own carriage. They dragged her through the streets and ironically dragged her into a Christian church where they ripped her clothes off of her and left her naked. They then began to stab her with what we think was possibly tiles or oyster shells. They also apparently, allegedly, scooped out her eyes. It is also stated that once she was dead, they dragged her body through the streets of Alexandria and then ripped her limbs apart and burnt them. Now the 2009 movie Agora, which I've used a lot of the pictures from that movie in this video clip, is the story of Hypatia's death. In this movie, which was a relatively good movie, they showed her death a little bit more peaceful. But nothing in the history books speaks about her death being peaceful at all. Sounds like a extremely traumatic way to go. Now, all the things that Hypatia contributed to our humanity through her academia, we're not even sure how much that was because of everything that eventually was lost when the library and the remains of the library were completely destroyed. And in fact, the only way we actually know about Hypatia and what an incredible scholar she was is because of her infamous death. After Hypatia's murder, all the other scholars would eventually make their way to Athens, Greece, where Athens, Greece would become the new place of learning. Again, soon after her death, we would enter into the Dark Ages, where the Roman Catholic Church would really start to dominate every aspect of human life. Now, as we've talked about on David's channel, The Dark Outpost TV, and here as well, it is my belief that when the Roman Empire adapted again this Christian faith. It wasn't actually the Christian faith, but a modified version of a satanic Canaanite faith. I believe the Dark Ages were done intentionally to destroy all the monumental progress humanity had made in getting to understand God and God's connection to the universe. 
Throughout the hundreds of years to follow, I believe that it was the Canaanites in the Roman Catholic Church and then eventually within the kingdoms of Europe that started to force this divide even more between God and man. And then ultimately in the early 1900s when the Federal Reserve was founded here in the United States and Woodrow Wilson signed it into our government, it was at that point that the Federal Reserve took over our public governmental education. And even for kids like myself who grew up in private schools, we still had to meet the standards of the state. We still had to learn a doctrine that was coming from the Federal Reserve and not necessarily from scholars. We saw this in our Giants episode where we learned about everything the Smithsonian has tried to hide, all the facts that debunk the narrative of evolution. Again, this is my belief, my opinion, that that is the Canaanites once again trying to separate us from the true almighty God. Because if we're able to look back at the works like people like Hypatia and those that came before her, science proves God. Science, math, philosophy, astronomy, it's all a part of this one beautiful universe. I know as we move forward into this beautiful awakening that we're all having, I believe our educational system will be backtracked, cleaned up, and redone. I believe that we will start to relearn the things that people like Hypatia and her father, Theon of Alexandria knew. We will start to celebrate the mysteries and the wonders of the universe given to us by a loving creator. And the true teachings of Jesus, the teachings of peace and love will rule our world. The violence and the hate of the Roman Catholic Church and of all these popes and these bishops will be no more. And hopefully people like Hypatia will smile down on humanity. For someone who's a history lover like me, it's very sad that the city of Alexandria today has very little of what it used to have. I wish beyond measure that the library of Alexandria was still standing. I wish we could find Cleopatra's tomb. But alas, as I said, with the death of Hypatia, eventually came the total death and destruction of the old Alexandria. All right, guys, let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. I have linked the movie trailer to the film Agora. You can't find the film on YouTube, but if you have Amazon Prime, you can rent it or watch it on Amazon Prime. I watched it on Amazon Prime last night. It was a pretty good movie. From my research, it did seem to follow the historic events pretty accurately. If you want to take a deeper dive into her specific life than what we've provided you with here. I've also got links to the other videos mentioned in this episode down below too. I hope all my American viewers had an awesome Thanksgiving with your friends and family. I hope you guys in Europe are doing well. We're heading into a really powerful month in December. Exciting times. Please again make sure you're taking care of yourself. Get some exercise. Eat healthy. Breathe. Drink water. Everything is going to be okay. Once again, thank you to Josh McKay for doing our music. If you would like to own this opening song for yourself on your own iTunes, you can follow the link below to purchase it. Also, thanks again to Todd Broderick for helping me create this video. A link to his band is down below as well. And I will talk to you guys soon. Bye.